If you're into trail camera photography or just love wildlife, this is the right place. Meet Chris Wimmer, the self-described camera trap codger, wildlife biologist, wildlife conservation consultant, and retired Smithsonian scientist. Be sure to stick around to the end to see some of his wonderful videos. Welcome, Chris. Glad to be here. Thank you, Kirby. <clears throat> My pleasure. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this, actually. So, um, talking to other trail camera photographers, they seem to be satisfied with still photography. What prompted you to change to video? Well, when I started out, I did still photography, but like a lot of early camera trappers, and this is going back into the 90s, uh, they weren't very happy with the quality of the photos um, that were taken by commercial trail cameras. So uh, there was this movement to start um, hacking your own cameras. They called it home brewing. And I used those home brewed cameras. So you could buy the parts, you could buy the controller board, and you could put it together yourself, or you could pay somebody else to make one for you. And I was quite happy with the, uh, the quality because these were point and shoot cameras and uh, they took high quality photographs. And I was quite happy with the stills. And the videos were not that good, but as the video technology improved in the commercial trail cams, and as I got into using cameras like uh, GoPros um, and hacking those, um, I was thrilled with some of the results that I got in video. And I also found that it was a lot easier for me to tell a story as someone who is trained in animal ecology and animal behavior using video rather than stills. Um, and I never got that good at, I don't consider myself to be a photographer. I, I just say I'm a zoologist who uses cameras, but um, I found that uh, it wasn't hard for me to get uh, interesting video clips. And so, um, I just switched over and started doing more and more video and uh, learned a lot while I was doing it. And I'm still learning. This is a, a, a hobby or a form of recreation where you're learning all the time because any camera trap is really a teaching instrument. And you can learn a tremendous amount from using it if you take advantage of all of its uh, capacities and functionality. But uh, yeah, that's how I got into the videos. And um, I've been doing it ever since. Uh, I don't belittle still camera photography at all because uh, there are a lot of wildlifers that take fantastic uh, stills. Um, but they don't lend themselves to a, an elaborate story because usually a fantastic portrait tells a story in itself or captures some special moment, some magical moment where it's all there and you look at it and it's like, wow, look at that. Um, there's nothing more that has to be said. Whereas um, I remember when I was first started teaching at Camera Trap Workshop at SF State University up at their field campus near Bassett's, uh, Sierra County, California. Um, I used to say, you know, it's much easier to get a really nice still picture than it is to get a video. Just look at what you see on the internet. And back in those days, what you used to see was <clears throat> kind of a flat gray picture if it was taken with uh, infrared lighting of a bobcat crossing a trail that lasted about five seconds. And that was it. And what you really want to do is go back and look at it again because it was kind of a moving target and you couldn't really see what was going on. 
And then you realize that, you know what, a really good flash photograph of that bobcat at the right moment was a more satisfying kind of viewing experience than looking at that five sec second movie clip. So um, the take home message from all of this is that um, if you wanna make an interesting, interesting video, you've got to get lots of different types of clips and you have to do your background research and you have to work at it. Um, it's a hobby for somebody with patience and it also helps to have a fleet of cameras that you're using at the same time so you can collect a lot of different video clips in different situations. Yeah, I, I think the uh, trail camera video has to be at least in order of magnitude more difficult than trail camera stills. So uh, you described some of the difficulties. What are, what are some of the others? Well, I would say that um, one of the difficulties is it just takes a lot more time. I know that it can take two hours to set up a um, DSLR with external flashes and to get the, uh, the, uh, the arrangement in the ideal uh, circumstance to capture a stunning image of the, the target species, whatever it is. Um, but with uh, collecting video, the way I do it is I set out a number of cameras that are really just kind of scouting cameras. I'm not trying to, to catch anything in particular to start with. I just want to see what's moving around. Where does it come from? Where does it go? Are there any kind of patterns in traffic? Um, do you see more than just coming and going? Um, that sort of thing. And then based on that scouting information, um, I set the cameras um, more carefully to capture a certain perspective, um, to get a certain kind of view. Um, when I made that uh, puma and deer video, um, I actually did a first version about a year ago, which I pretty much threw out because I just wasn't happy with what I'd gotten. It was mostly pictures of pumas coming and going on trails. Um, and some fairly stunning images of animals walking right up to the camera and kind of changing direction right before the camera so you could see the whole body moving out of sight and that sort of thing. But it didn't tell much of a story. And in the course of one year, I then uh, acquired additional footage of some very interesting um, aspects of natural history that you just don't see that commonly. So. I, I think that maybe the biggest challenge for making interesting videos is to stick with it long enough and to do your research um, that you can get the occasional things that happen that are very interesting or spectacular or that big explanation um, that you're not going to get if you have a camera just set on a trail. And that kind of that's a sort of thing that takes scouting and uh, understanding the natural history well enough that uh, you know what to look for. So for example, if you want to, bears are amusing animals and it's easy to get footage of bears, especially around here where I live, they're all over the place. I have to take my bird feeders in every night so the bears don't get at them. <clears throat> but one of the things that we know bears do or that I learned after I moved here and walked my dog on many trails through the woods, is that in late August and September, you start to see yellow jacket nests dismembered and lying next to the trails through the woods and along the canals up here. And it's that time of year that yellow jackets um, are going in that kind of frenzy um, to kind of stock up and to get the brood ready for the next year after the winter comes and everything dies off. So um, the nest is filled with nutritious food and that's when the bears and the skunks start digging them out of the ground. I don't have any footage of this yet because 
it's risky setting a camera up near a hornet's nest. But this is something I would love to get, and I have my eye out for it. And just the other day, trimming brush here on my outside the house, just down the hill from the house in the chaparral, I found a big underground nest that had been dug out of the ground. And it happened within a stone's throw of the house. I completely missed it. I never knew that nest was there. So I, this year, I'm going to try again to find some yellow jacket nests and set cameras up uh, to see what I can get. And by the way, I've checked YouTube on this and I found uh, a small number of videos of bears and even gray foxes uh, dismembering underground yellow jacket nests. So hmm. other others have gotten it um, and have put cameras out in interesting places like this and uh, captured some fascinating footage. Yeah, having been attacked by yellow jackets when I stumbled on their nest, uh, I can understand the difficulties. <laughs> that's right. It's a high risk business. You don't want to do it if you have aller an allergic reaction. That's for sure. Yeah. So part part of the uh, skill that's required is uh, tracking. I'm assuming, huh? Yes. I mean, um, it's good to be able to read sign. <clears throat> and anybody can learn it. There's a number of books out there, including some with absolutely beautiful illustrations. Um, so yes, tracking helps a lot. Um, I found that having a, a reasonably well-trained dog can teach you a tremendous amount about what goes on in the woods because uh, you can see the world through your dog's nose. And the dog will pay very close attention to certain things, and you don't know what they are. Its world is so different from our world um, that we miss a lot not having a nose like a dog. Yeah. But I have spent a lot of time watching my dog, getting down and trying to sniff what it's sniffing and smelling nothing different from anything else, um, but gradually accumulating knowledge as a result. For example, one of the things that you see on the bases of the live oak trees around here, they're often covered with moss. And uh, I noticed my dog would sniff at these places. And I noticed in some places, the moss was streaked with yellow. In other words, it was no longer green and it had died. And what I learned was that this was Kind of a spritz location for bobcats, um, maybe even mountain lions. I don't know which species, but um, that's a place where you can set a camera and get some interesting footage of exactly what happens and how it happens. So that's something that I learned from my dog. And plus, dogs can find you know potential denning sites. Uh, resting sites. Uh, my dog pays attention to um, daytime beds made by black bears. When it gets really hot in the summertime, what they'll do is <clears throat> they'll go out and they'll start, they'll find a north slope usually around here in a dense patch of uh, Douglas fir saplings where it's shady and there tend to be updrafts coming up out of the ravine below. And then it looked like somebody took a, a rototiller in there and churned up the ground and kind of pushed it out. And that's the day bed where they lie down and kind of uh, cool themselves off through the thin hair on their belly and chest um, and doze off, nod off and take a nice uh, midsummer's day nap. And uh, that's something that my dog has found and that I have become uh, keenly aware of now, but I knew very little about that when I first retired and came out here and started to do this stuff. So being something of a wildlife biologist definitely helps, huh? It definitely does, but you don't have to get a advanced degree or even a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology, anybody who's a uh, curious naturalist um, or who wants to be a naturalist and has curiosity 
and learn these things on their own. Um, it's just a matter of going out there and spending time in the woods, looking around, setting your cameras, um, decoupling your sensorium from the discomforts of being out there when mosquitoes can be swarming and that sort of thing. But uh, that's how you learn. And that's how I've learned um, my whole life. I was never um, afraid to go out in the woods. I just loved it. And if you, uh, if you feel that way, uh, you can learn a lot. And the other thing is that the camera can teach you a tremendous amount if you take the time <clears throat> to download the EXIF information, or if you just have the, uh, that little data strip turned on using a commercial trail camera, it'll give you the temperature, which isn't completely accurate, but it's a, <clears throat> it gives you a ballpark idea of what the temperature is. It kind of jumps around a bit if you look at successive frames or clips. Um, but if you look at the time of day, and you look at the visitation of certain species, um, using that information, uh, you can start to see patterns that you wouldn't uh, normally see very easily just uh, scanning through your pictures on your camera or downloading the files and just looking at them one after the other. So I find that to be very useful. Um, and I go to kind of extraordinary lengths to savor the data that way. I make a spreadsheet for every camera trap set that I take and I download the file numbers in one column and next to it I have the EXIF data so I have the date and the time and then I have another column for species and then I have a column for comments and then I use like the fifth column I think that would be for weather conditions um, additional notes uh, high winds uh, bright contrasty light uh, great horned owl calling in the background, that sort of thing. Um, so I have a record. I can go back to any set I've done in the last 10 years, and I can look at all the information that was collected at that location between the beginning and the ending date of that particular camera trap set. Um, so it's, in a sense, it's, a, it's the total documentation. Now, one thing I did learn with time that is if, if you keep all of your video clips, including all the false triggers that you get, uh, you're gonna use up your memory on your computer real fast um, yeah. or, or on your external drive. And you should always keep backups on external drives. So I go through and I scour the, uh, each folder from my camera trap sets and get rid of all of the clips that don't show anything. And that may include a lot of gray squirrels that are digging for acorns or deer mice that are running back and forth on a stick that's within the frame, that sort of thing, I get rid of them. And even pictures of um, species that are of special interest, if it's half of the body, which I call a partial or a distant shot where it's just a fleeting image in the background, I get rid of those too because I get lots of them. Yeah. So what I have in the end is um, the cream of the captures. And then they go into a folder, the original folder, with the spreadsheet, and also with a, uh, a CVS file. Is it a CVS file? I think that's what they call a CVS file, which is another type of spreadsheet, <clears throat> which contains all that EXIF data. So I've got that too, even though I've trans. Uh, I've copied and pasted that into my, my data sheet. So that's going to extremes. And uh, <laughs> most people are not going to want to do it. But for me, that's what works. Your inner scientist is coming out, I think. Yeah, that's true. I'm a data freak. <laughs> so uh, how much time is involved in... Uh getting these five, six minute clips that you have posted on Vimeo? Well, um, I'll give you an example of something that happened just recently. It was, uh, <clears throat> actually it was last year. Um, I mentioned to a neighbor that keep an eye open for nest cavities in these oak trees. 
because uh, she and her husband, she's a photographer and she and her husband uh, do a lot of long walks through the woods around here. And uh, I kept kind of bugging her about, do you find any nest cavities? And she said, well, I know where there's some. So I went out with them one afternoon and uh, she pointed out this kind of broken down black oak tree. And it had what looked like it might be a cavity at about seven feet height above the ground, seven feet above the ground. And uh, fortunately there was a Douglas fir that was about maybe six feet away. So I put the, uh, I put a camera, a commercial trail cam up at, just above my head on this Douglas fir, cinched it on with a strap, uh, used a little mechanics mirror, you know, with a little handle on it to look at the uh, LCD to make sure it was centered properly. And I left it for about, probably about a month, maybe even five weeks. And we came back in early January and looked at the pictures right in the field there. And darn, if there weren't a bunch of pictures of a ringtail going in and out of that hole. Hmm. It didn't even look to me like it was a hole. I thought I'm gonna get a bunch of paramiscus deer mice. Um, but here was this ringtail and I was totally ecstatic. And I went home and I studied the pictures and uh, I had reset the camera already. So I, I waited another three or four weeks and uh, I did this into the spring, thinking that this might be a den tree where a female would give birth. Well, <clears throat> what I found was that the ringtail came about every seven to 10 days and um, it would stay for about two or three days. And I got tremendous shots of it going in and out of that hole, um, which I made a little movie of. And on one occasion, it did a very long grooming session, which was just fantastic. I got all of the grooming behavior. It grooms its face like a rodent. Beautiful. Um, but I noticed that sometimes it went in the hole, and I never saw it come out, and then I saw it go in the hole again. And that meant that there had to be another exit and entrance in that tree. And there was a torn off limb about 12 or 15 feet higher up the tree. So for that, I decided I'd set another camera. So I had to bring in a ladder and a friend because we're both old men. And I had one of those uh, telescoping ladders, which are kind of scary to use, but they work well. They wobble a little bit. And I got up there and I set a second camera. And I did get a few shots of the ringtail going in and out of that as well. And that made a very interesting picture. But in the end, I, there was no breeding. There were no little baby ringtails peeking out of the hole or playing outside of the entrance. Um, it must have gone someplace else because by the time April rolled around in May, that ringtail was no longer using that den hole. And then I realized in retrospect that, you know what? You should have set a camera at the base of the tree so you could show it going down and touching ground and moving away. You should have had it climbing up the tree. You should have moved the camera about 90 degrees to the side so you had a lateral shot of it going in and out and you would have had more interesting perspectives to show. So that's my project for the future. I will do that, but that was one year of work to get several dozen clips of a ringtail going in and out of a den in a dying black oak snag. So um, that's how it ends up taking time. Yeah, and uh, patience. And patience. Yeah, you, you can't, you really want to, once you set the camera, you want to just leave it alone and, and not be going back and forth all the time because you're giving cues to animals, leaving your scent trail there all the time. But in my experience, um, it doesn't really freak the animals out. There's a lot of people walking through the woods. There's dogs. Uh, they're picking up, you know, scent information from all kinds of animals. So um, I think some, in some ways it's overplayed the scent. 
the idea, idea that human scent is scaring the animal away, so away is, is overplayed. So you mentioned a couple of different cameras. Uh, talk about how you, what cameras you use and how you use them. Well, um, I used to use um, the home brewed cameras, which, and the best one was called the Sony, uh, I think it was the DCM S600. And it was just the perfect little point and shoot camera to hack for a camera trap. Um, it had an adjustable flash. Um, it just took beautiful videos and uh, uh, had a nice, fairly wide angle lens. And it was a great little camera. There's still a few around, but they eventually die on you. Um, so I used to use those. Uh, and then over the years, the commercial trail camera industry kept improving their products. And uh, eventually they came out with models that really had, that really took pretty good still pictures and the videos were getting really good, at least the daytime videos. There was a lag uh, in getting up to speed with uh, nighttime infrared lit videos, but that gradually improved too. And now there are some models that give you know, nicely contrasted uh, images during the nighttime uh, movie video images. So um, I pretty much switched over to commercial trail cams, but I still have a small fleet of uh, GoPro Hero 2s that have been hacked. And they give, when you get it right, you can't beat the images or the videos that you get with those GoPros. It's just the wide angle uh, perspective is, uh, can give really stunning action sequences. Just, you know, well, they're called action cameras and people use them on motorcycles and mountain bikes and everything else, you know, so they're, hmm. they're built for that. Um, but it's only those early models. I think the one and two, the Hero one and two, um, that lend themselves, maybe the three, I can't remember, that lend themselves to hacking because they have a bus port on the back of the camera. So you can uh, you can make all your hookups without opening the camera and doing anything inside. You, you just have to hook that bus port in and wire it to your uh, controller and you can have a very nice little camera trap. And those old ones go for pretty cheap now. They're less than 100 bucks. You can get them for 40 or 50 bucks, or at least a couple of years ago, you could. Um, okay. They're a bit heat up looking, but they still do the job. So now, uh, to answer your question, or just to summarize the answer, I use both uh, the hacked cameras and the commercial uh, trail cameras. Any of the commercial cameras that you recommend specifically? Well, the one, the ones that I use, um, and there's a small group of us who are in communication all the time and kind of exchange notes on our uh, experiences with them, are the Brownings and the uh, this the the most recent innovation, which. Uh, we all appreciate it a lot is we've gotten away from the uh, lack of any time setting. In other words, in the older models of uh, trail cams, what you had was uh, you put it on and you got a 24 hour shooting. So it would shoot mm -hmm. during the day and the night. And that satisfied the hunting uh, or the hunters out there, the hunting interests who use camera traps. Um, but you always, under certain circumstances, are going to get false triggers or, or triggers that don't contain animals that are due to uh, thermal noise. And um, you just, you it's hard to avoid. There are places where you want to set a camera and you're going to, you're going to get thermal noise. So um, if you have the opportunity to set the timing, and you can set the time for like uh, to turn on at 
six thirty at night and to turn off at eight thirty in the morning, um, you can get some soft daylight uh, videos, softly lit daylight videos, and you can get uh, nighttime infrared videos as well. And uh, you'll be quite happy with the results, and you will not have to pour through hundreds and hundreds of false triggers. Uh, you can quickly go through false triggers by just looking at the EXIF data and looking at the timing. If you're getting a picture every 15 seconds or every minute or two, and it just goes on and on and on, and you scan through the pictures, scroll down through the pictures uh, or the thumbnails, and you just, just see the same pattern, uh, you know that uh, Mother Nature has been toying with you and, and uh, you're gonna erase all of those those images. So this is, is a very useful feature that the uh, commercial trail cams now have a capture timer so you can set the on time and the off time. There's kind of a curious thing that's happened in the development of commercial trail cams. And I may be off on this, but I get a very strong impression that um, they make an improvement in one feature and then another feature that you really liked that you thought had finally reached a state where it was uh, completely acceptable disappears or goes retrograde and uh, doesn't do as well anymore. So it's kind of like you make an advance and progress on one front in terms of the camera technology and then you take a step backwards on another front. And I don't know if this is just uh, uh, capitalism in one of its uh, less desirable uh, manifestations, or if it's something that just can't be avoided. I don't, in the way the supply chain and the uh, plans for new models works. But um, it would be really nice if, if, if once you get some high functionality that satisfies a lot of your users, did you just stick with it? And you could add more bells and whistles, but uh, stick with the things that really work. So those are the kind of the frustrations of working with, with the commercial trail cams. But I, I have to say that the image quality is pretty acceptable to most people. People that want 4K are gonna have to go with, you know, DSLRs um, and lay out a lot of money to get a camera that takes professional level video. Um, sure. Or stills. Um, and, you know, for the big companies that, or for the professional photographers that, that, that supply footage to nature or to the BBC or whoever else is producing wildlife videos, that's no issue. That's no issue. As they say, if you get the money shot, who cares if the tiger ate the camera? You know? <laughs> Yeah, true. Well, maybe you could send me the the models of the uh, Brownings that you like, and I can put those in the show notes for people that want to check that out. Yeah, let me let me do that. Um, there's there's several that are out there. Unfortunately, they kind of come and go pretty quickly now. Um, if you find one that you like, you better buy up uh, a supply if you need more than one because. Um, Time passed, time rolls on, and the next time you look, they may not be available anymore, or there'll yeah. be just a few dealers who have them. Yeah. Okay. So uh, apparently you uh, like to use multiple camera setups, so we'll talk about that a bit. Um, I didn't hear that, Herbie. Look. You, you mentioned a couple of times using uh, different setups, and I gather... From looking at your videos, you use multiple cameras. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I like to, uh, even, even though some of these cameras take really nice uh, nighttime video using infrared, I found that if you use two, uh, two cameras um, at an angle to one another, aimed at the same um, target area, the same field of view, um, or overlapping fields of view, that uh, if you vary the difference on the two cameras, you'll get that kind of side lighting 
that casts a few kind of soft shadows on the animal's body so that you can see contour better. So um, that's something that a number of camera trappers are now doing, not a large number, but uh, those who are trying to get um, interesting uh, video will use that technique. Uh, and I find that there's oftentimes a need to make special mounts for cameras. Um, there's a lot of volcanic landscape up here. And if you want to secure a camera uh, on a stake, it's sometimes hard to drive the stake into the ground. And for that, I just use the kind of down and dirty skid mount, which is a, a figure H of two by fours with a vertical stem on it. I, use, I usually use an old four by four. And then I mount the camera on that. I just carry that thing out to where I want to set it down, plop it on the ground, put some rocks on the base to hold it in place and use that as a mount. And it works quite nicely in certain situations. Well, one of the problems I have here is <clears throat> most of these stream beds have been uh, eroded down to bedrock and volcanic capstone. So you can't drive a stake into the stream bed where the camera is secure and can't be knocked over by a bear. So this is a real problem in that it limits uh, opportunities for placing cameras in an optimal situation for viewing the animals. Um, and it means that sometimes you just have to cast about for alternative sites and find a better place to set the camera. Uh, that all takes time. And the further you get away from home, um, the longer it takes to get there too. So those are the kinds of problems that I encounter doing uh, making various camera trap sets. And I have made, I've got drawers and cabinets filled with all kinds of metal mounts um, because I was too cheap to buy the, the stuff that's available on the market. But now I'm buying RAM mounts and things like that that are ball and socket mounts that are pretty versatile. Um, but I found that there is a need to oftentimes make a specialized mount in order to get an interesting view into a cavity in a tree or to place a camera, say in a horizontal cleft in the rim rock where it's rock above and rock below. And you wanna fasten that camera and anchor it in place. So you have to make like an expansion bar that you can expand and kind of bore into the ceiling and the floor so that the camera can't be moved by a passing animal. Um, I probably overdo it a bit um, because I like to fool around in the garage uh, and make things. Um, you can often just make do with what you find in the woods too. If you carry a pruning saw, uh, a uh, short machete, or I carry a Nepalese kukri, which is a very heavy, short knife, uh, which you can trim branches off of a dead sapling very easily with, and a pruning shears, uh, you can often make do very easily. And in rocky habitat, you can always build a cairn out of rocks that you find on the ground. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, we encountered a dead cow up in uh, Los Molinos, up the road from where I live. And uh, the eagles and vultures had already removed most of the entrails, but I was very excited to find it. We just made a rocky cairn and put the camera in that cairn, faced towards the animal. And I went away for nine months and didn't come back. And when I got back, I found out that the card was filled, it was like a 64 gigabyte card, was filled in three days. Mm -hmm. 
So I had a tremendous number of 30 second clips because I usually take 30 second clips um, that I had to pour through. But I got some great footage and saw some really interesting things. Of eagles or what? Well, the, the, the eagle was lame in one leg, which was kind of interesting. It kind of hobbled around on one good leg and kind of held its other leg in a fist. It was a young adult. Um, I found out that the ravens would finally get so frustrated with the turkey vultures hogging the carcass going into the body cavity that the ravens would pull the wing feathers. The, the longest feather on a, a vulture when he's feeding are the wing feathers, which kind of cross um, over the tail. And the ravens would take and pull the wing and pull the, ra pull the turkey vulture right out of the carcass, <laughs> much to the irritation of the turkey vulture, which would hiss, and, uh, but would desist. And then the ravens would rush in to feed themselves. And then, of course, there was the coyote action. And they showed up mostly at night. And uh, these coyotes, I think, had been shot at because they were very shy. And uh, they even reacted to the R IR light of the commercial trail camera. But I still start, got some good interactions between coyotes. Oh, that's pretty cool. Well, why don't we take a look at uh, one of your videos and uh, kind of discuss it. I'm going to share my screen once I get it going here. You can see one of the cameras in the background on this one. If you look at the left, around uh, eight o'clock. Yeah, I saw, that on the, I saw it yeah. on the initial shot anyway. <laughs> yeah. Here's a squirrel's eye view. There's the codger making a fashion statement. There's a GoPro clip. Another GoPro clip. It's also a GoPro. We're back to uh, probably a browning. And you can see a GoPro on the left here on the stake. I tried to edit it and crop it out on this one. I have hundreds of these trail pictures of it approaching and moving away from the camera. I'm sorry, say that again. I have hundreds of clips of comings and goings like that uh, with the mountain lions.
that was one of those rare kind of serendipitous events. How so? Well, where the, the deer is there with the fawn, you don't even know the fawn's in the area. And she hears the alarm call of the, a, probably a family member nearby. She becomes very alert and then she makes a mad dash and then you see the fawn running through following her. Ah, uh, yeah. This is a cool clip here. Yeah, this is a young female. Very relaxed and not worried about the cameras or anything. Yeah, she doesn't even seem to notice it. Yeah. And she just plopped down right where you front and center. Yeah. Like she is posing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> These are the ones that kind of knock your socks off. Yeah, absolutely. There were several clips, and so I, uh, you know, I cut and pasted to put it together. It's, this isn't the full sequence of action. It lasted much longer than this. Yeah. I figured you had to do a lot of editing. Mm-hmm. And the hardest thing is getting the voiceover right. I'm sorry? Okay. I say the hardest thing for me is getting the voiceover right. Uh -huh. I hate to hear my voice, and uh, it's it's hard to get satisfied to be satisfied. And you often, I often change the script as I'm making the movie. You're a perfectionist, in other words. So this is the cub. Examining the camera. And then the mother calls. And the cub answers. But she doesn't leave right away. And then the after reaction, or the after effect, and the deers, the deer sniffing the place. Now, I think this is that female. I'm not positive. Same one we saw earlier? Yes, the one with the cub. Ah. Uh. Because okay. I, I never got any more pictures of the female with the cub. I find the cub by itself. So I think this is the female uh, coming into estrus. Okay. I always say this is what a scout master do, does not want the kids to hear when they're camping out <laughs> in the woods. Yeah, I guess not. That'd wake you right up. <laughs> and then here's the, uh, the the consequence with the male. He's located the female, and now he's tracking the female, courting the female. Here we have the running behavior in the black-tailed deer. 
during a, the period of high vulnerability to predation. Here's the male. No. I'm not sure what the sex is on that one or what I said. I recorded this, this buck several times in this location. So I knew who he was. And there's the chase. Again, ser an example of serendipity, being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Well, that makes all the effort worthwhile when you get something like that you can put together. Thank you. Well, I really do, do believe anybody can do it. <clears throat> if you just, you have to be a bit obsessive and you have to have, be, a, you have to be patient. But uh, if you do your homework and keep working at it, you're going to get very interesting footage. Yeah, well, if the rest of us could do as well as you're doing, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find you and your work? You obviously you're on Vimeo, any other social sites or any a website or anything? Well, I'm on Vimeo and <clears throat> I found out that I can also post uh, Vimeo videos on YouTube, so I'm doing that now, although my YouTube videos, which go way back and are not very good quality, um, do not overlap many of the Vimeo videos. So if you look at both sets, you're gonna, uh, you're not gonna see the same thing, um, not completely anyway. And then I've got a, uh, I used to post regularly on a blog called Camera Trap Codger, <clears throat> and uh, I kind of burned out on that. Um, it was a real hodgepodge of camera trapping pictures and uh, travel experiences and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I've kind of quit uh, posting blog posts regularly now. Um, and the other thing is uh, I was trying to finish this book on camera trapping called a camera trapper's companion, and I just sent sent off the last two chapters to the editor. Um, so um, one of these days that'll finally be printed. I didn't have time to do a blog and write a book at the same time, and as it is, the book has taken me probably about eight years to write because mm. I didn't do it as a full time. I was learning as I was writing it actually. So camera trap codger. Vimeo and YouTube are the three sites, and they all they they all overlap to a certain extent. In other words, anything anything that I post on Vimeo or YouTube in the past was on the blog the blog post as well. Well, thanks for sharing, Chris. Uh, it's been great fun, and uh, I sure learned a lot. And I love your videos, and I admire your work ethic and dedication for sure. It's uh, it's obviously a lot of work. Well, thank you, Kirby. It was a pleasure being here. Each episode of Photographing the West is published on the 15th and 30th of the month. We'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode. If you enjoy these episodes, please support them through shopping the resources in the show notes. Thanks for watching, and bye for now. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>